The order, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes, Your Honor. Council Member August. Here. Council Member Leesmeyer. Here. Council Member Edgerton. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Denver. Here. Mayor Mann. Here. Thank you. And we have words of inspiration tonight by uh, Pastor Derek Greenhog, the First Baptist Church of Sun City. Good evening. Good evening. Father God, thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together as a city. We pray that you would bless this meeting, that it would be fruitful, and that uh, the council would apply wisdom, and that you would give them guidance. We pray also for the citizens that are here. We ask, God, that the conversations would be uh, civil, and that the dialogue would be creative and uh, respectful in all aspects. So please just continue to bless our city as we grow, and bless your citizens in it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, Councilman Rogers, would you lead some pledge? Yes, would you please join me in a pledge of allegiance to our flag? Ready? We get it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen. We have a couple of presentations tonight. Would you join me up front, Council? Mr. Edgerton, they're heading up to do. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We do have a couple of proclamations to issue tonight. And uh, if, uh, George, would you please join me up, up front and center? Um, come on up. How are you, sir? Welcome back. Welcome back to Menifee City Hall. You join us right here next to Mr. Leesmeyer. Of course. So uh, the month of April, Every year is Mental uh, Illness Month, and in the city of Menifee, we have a proclamation that designates uh, this month in the city of Menifee as such, whereas uh, mental illness can impact anyone regardless of age, background, employment, education, or income level. And mental illness usually strikes individuals in the prime of their lives, often during adolescence and young adulthood, although the very young and the elderly are especially vulnerable. And many treatments for serious mental illnesses in combination with treatment and recovery supports are highly effective, allowing people to maintain their quality of life and their involvement with their families and communities. And recent population data suggests that nearly 140,000 people of all ages in Riverside County as a whole uh, may be impacted by serious mental illness and may seek treatment from a variety of community resources. And the Mental Health America has promoted the observance of May is Mental Health Month, not April, sorry, since 1949, in order to increase awareness and understanding of mental health. And the Riverside County Behavioral Health Commission is presenting the live Live Life Well, a mental health fair on Thursday, May 21st, 2015, at Fairmont Park in Riverside in support of May as Mental Health Month observance and encouraging awareness of mental health issues and promoting wellness and recovery for those with mental health needs are important values for every community throughout the county. Therefore, the City of Menifee proclaims May is Mental Health Month in the City of Menifee approved and adopted by the City Council this date. Thank you, sir. Uh, the, the, absolutely. Good morning, all. Um, what is mental illness? Mental illness can be defined as a disease process affecting the brain that causes mild to severe disturbances in a person's thinking and perception of their life and the world around them. This can impair the person's ability to cope with life's ordinary demands and routines resulting in abnormal behavior. The term mental illness wrongly implies a distinction between an illness of the body and an illness of the mind. Our mind is one of the most important products of our brain. We use the brain to generate and relate thoughts and actions. We walk, talk, feel, see, hear, stimuli of the body. An illness or chemical imbalance within the body can directly impact the complex processes within the brain, causing a malfunction in the behavioral processes of the mind. Laugh and cry as a function of the brain's response to internal and external. You will know there's five major categories, 
anxiety disorders, mood disorders, schizophrenia, dementia, you, get, you can become mentally ill when you get older, and of course eating disorders, and they cover many things. Due to the continuous education of the population with proclamations like this, we recognize these illnesses and people affected. We never call, we call them clients with a mental illness. Many years ago, such people with mental illnesses were called lunatics and sent to asylums. And I brought this, I can't show it to you, but my mother's, my mother's mother went to an asylum. And this would be a typical document that you would get. And this was in London, Hanwell Asylum. You had any of those illnesses, you do it straight away, zip to a place where you would be terribly treated. Kate Middleton, some of you know about the royal family. Here she is. She said, Kate Middleton shows her support for children struggling with mental health. Health. It's okay to ask for help. And I could go on. It's, it's important to realize that it's still with us. Even one of the future crowns of England, his wife, is promoting awareness. And just to finish off, the Mountie County Mental Health Board needs volunteers to serve on its board. Meetings are the first Thursday of the month at various clinics in the mid-county, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Applications I have here, only got a couple of them. From experience, I don't get more than two of them. But it's worthwhile if you have some time and you have some interest, nursing background. Anyone interested in this board, please, you can go to http mentalhealth.co riverside us. Please remember, if you have somebody who has a mental illness, just remember, we now call them clients. They are seriously have a problem and they can be treated. And that's why we, the mental health in Riverside County is so ser serious uh, an event. Thank you. Thank you, George. this back to the government? <laughs> Thank you, sir. This next presentation is near and dear to my heart. Uh, John Dreher, would you please join me up front and center? So um, tonight we have the uh, privilege of honoring a marvelous public servant in the city of Menifee, a long time serving, caring uh, contributor to this community, John Dreher. Uh, this year the Menifee Valley Little League turned 25 years old. And of those 25 years, uh, we have uh, John Dreher has been on the board for those whole 20 years and he is the president, I believe, once again and has been for many, many years. And we have another, are there any other board members in the room? I think Mr. Shane Spicer is here, yes? And Amy, how you doing Amy? So um, this is a special occasion for me personally because I've known John for all of those years that, that he has been uh, involved with Menifee Valley Little League and uh, he was my son's very, very first Little League coach. And so, like Tyler and other youth in the, in the community, they've grown up, they have families, and you are actually, uh, those kids that you coach are now coaching for you in the league, and they're coaching young kids. And uh, one of the most amazing things, and I know over all these years we've had uh, issues of conflicting ball field times, whether it's soccer or Little League and softball, AAU, we have light issues, et cetera, who's gonna pay for what, when, but you know, it always seems to work out. It seems to work out because of the leaders that are uh, involved in, in those organizations and you are absolutely uh, one of those leaders and I want to say personally from the bottom of my heart, thank you for the leadership that you've given in this community 
and the impact that you've had on the lives of young men and women, and especially you were instrumental in that, the challenger, establishing the challenger division uh, for the Little League, which is, and, and maybe you can tell a little bit more about that after I read the proclamation, but we're talking about some special needs uh, children, uh, giving them the ability to uh, play baseball, America's great pastime, and partnering them with another youth in the community that wants to step up and volunteer to be that mentor. Marvelous program, inspiration, you're the one that was the catalyst for that. So tonight, John, for all your years of service, we have the City of Menifee Proclamation, whereas the Menifee Valley Little League celebrated its 25th season, and the league president, John Dreher, has worked with the league for over 20 years and has helped the program grow to serve an average of 500 children per year. And league president John Dreher has consistently volunteered his time through his own children in the league and many other families, including mine, and, and some in the audience, and even worked with other members to start the Challenger Division for children of special needs who would otherwise not be able to take part in the wonderful sport of baseball. And the City Council of the City of Menifee wishes to congratulate the Menifee Valley Little League on its 25th anniversary, and especially thank and congratulate you, John, President John Dreher, for your years of service and dedication to the league and the area's children who are served by this league. Thank you very much for your, your effort. humbled and, and very happy about this. Um, I couldn't have done any of this without my wife, Lynn, who has been with me for all those 20 years and has given me great advice and um, helped me through all this. And I'd also like to thank all the youth of this community, um, make my job very easy. Um, all they want to do is play ball, and all we do is effort them and give them the, the opportunity to do so. Um, I'd also, if you have a minute, I'd like to um, speak about our Challenger program. This is for the, um, not only are they handicapped with um, mental issues, but they're also physical issues. Uh, we have about 25 kids or so in the program now, ages 40, 4 to we have actually a 37-year-old girl in a wheelchair. Um, these kids are blind. Um, uh, they, have, they can't walk. Some of them can't walk. We have uh, kids in wheelchairs. And what we do, the opportunity, Amy is uh, spearhead in this program, we give them the opportunity for two hours out of their week to be normal kids playing in the dirt, playing baseball. And this is, uh, if you ever have the opportunity to watch these kids play ball, I, I effort you to come out and watch these kids play baseball. And uh, they're just playing it for the love of the game. And it's my honor just to be part of this community. So I want to thank Mayor Mann. I want to thank the council. I want to thank the city. Um, this means a lot. Thank you. Thank you all. Next on the agenda, we have approval of the meeting minutes from April 1st. Are there any modifications to the minutes of April 1st, 2015? Uh, yes. Council Member Edgerton? Oh, he moved approval. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Those minutes are approved. Madam Clerk, are there any modifications to the agenda? No, sir, as posted. Hearing none, the agenda is approved. On to public comments. Would you please call the first speaker? Yes, sir. Greg Menzel. Public speakers, I've had a special request for Mr. Edgerton that when you do come up and speak, 
that you get right on that microphone because otherwise he struggles to hear from that mic. If you could get right on it, he'd very much appreciate it. Good evening, Mayor, Councilman, Mr. Edgington. You were my daughter's teacher back in the day. But anyway, I spoke to you, the council members here uh, two weeks ago about the subdivision that Elsinore, the zone change with subdivisions on the last 20 acres along Holland Road. I was very thankful and impressed by Mr. Lesmeyer is the only one that supported me and sent a letter to the Planning Commission. There was no other representative from Menifee in attendance at the Elsinore Planning Commission. There was all of the people that owned property on both sides of the street around the subdivision were there. Most of us spoke. It was a pass unanimously to go with 83 units plus 20 granny flats in there. You are now going to be dumping about 150 to 200 cars a day on Holland Road. Holland Road is a massive problem in this city. Uh, the bad, the thing that since then, I have talked to Kevin Jeffries and his representative in his Elsinore office is Bob McGee, who is a city councilman in Elsinore. He was not aware of this. He thinks the Elsinore Planning Commission, he likes you. <laughs> he thinks the, the master plan requires a buffer zone. They're going for 7,000 square foot lots, and there is supposed to be a buffer zone in Elsinore going from a 7,000 lot to one acre or five acre or 20 acre parcels like we have. The lots are supposed to leak get larger and larger as it gets close to the rural area. They are, the lots are the same size. What Elsinore approved, Planning Commission approved, was that rather than a six foot wall be built on the property line of your Menifee residence, an eight foot wall would be built. One, all the houses along Anna Street, rather than two story houses, they will build just one story houses so where they don't look down into our goats and our sheep and our horses and our boats, our RVs. Most of us along there have multiple toys. That's why we live where we live. Uh, the Elsinore City Council will, this will be on their agenda May 17th. I would hope I am going to be handing out flyers to all the traffic on Holland Road, hopefully in the next two weeks at the stop signs in the morning to let all the residents that kids go to school at the Herc Boris Elementary School that they can plan on more traffic being Mr. added Minson, to Holland Road. That's your time. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you much. Next speaker, please. Tony Amatuli. Uh, good evening. I'm Tony Amatuli from uh, Amatuli Auto Parts, uh, resident of Menifee, California, and I'm also president of the chairman of the board of the uh, Menifee Chamber of Commerce. I'm here this evening to uh, do a verbal press release that uh, Dorothy Wallens, our CEO, is on an extended leave, and our board decided that we needed to have an interim CEO run the office. Uh, we've hired one. Uh, her name is uh, D. Cozart. She's a uh, resident of San Jacinto. She's uh, been in this valley since the early 70s. She graduated from San Jacinto High School, uh, San Jacinto College, and um, she's her main, uh, tomorrow what we're going to do a written of, uh, press release, so you'll see, see more of it because it would take more than three minutes to tell her everything she's done. But uh, I just want to reassure the, our members of our chamber, the city council, and the city staff, that the chamber office is up and running and on all cylinders, and that uh, it's not going to skip a beat. And uh, that's about it. I don't know if anybody had any questions, but I uh, just want to make sure John met her this morning, so I thought it was a good idea for me to 
in, uh, hope, um, she was just hired three days ago, so unfortunately she had plans tonight or she'd have been here out of the personally, but uh, hopefully this will make the next city council meeting. But uh, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Amatudley. We look forward to meeting her. Next speaker, please. Katie Muneer. Good evening. Wally, tonight I'd like to address you since you had some comments after I left the DS last time. You voted to oust Bill Rawlings when he was here. Then you went on to say what a wonderful job he did. And now you're saying Rob Johnson has worked his way up the ladder. He was placed in that job. He has no resume. He was placed in that job. He's cost the taxpayers more money than I can count with his inability and lack of knowledge of the job. The city had to have Sean Nelson come back to train him, although the contract was written to cover up that reason. The city seems to have a way of writing contracts that don't really show what they're for. I'm going to ask you, Wally, to step down before the taxpayers have to pay for a special election or before Mayor Mann gets to appoint his pick to fill your seat. I happen to live in your district, so I'm concerned about who's going to be in the seat and who's going to represent us. I hope also, Wally, I hope for your good health, but I hope you find it in your heart and in your conscience to tell the truth about the sludge that was dumped in this city. You know, as well as I do, that you know the whole truth. And it needs to come out and it needs to be told. I've stood on this podium for five years now talking about this. And it's fallen on deaf ears. And you're one that knows the truth and won't speak up to protect the people. Thank you. Next speaker, please. James Heineman. I'm speaking before you tonight about an issue I sincerely believe the City Council has failed to take seriously despite it being maybe arguably your most important mission in leading the city, and that's law enforcement. The level of police protection in Menifee is not woefully lacking. I believe it's essentially non-existent. Woefully lacking would be a measurable step forward. I allege that the public safety is not a priority of this council as a collective group. I'm going to give you a statistic. This is a good number. You can disagree with me in any directions that you will for your political reasoning, but you can't go against this statistical value. I'm going to give you what's called the 1% of 1%. Now, if we can agree that the population of Menifee is approximately 83,000, give or take, but let's use that as a figure because it's close. If we take 1% of 83,000, that's 830. You take 1% of that, you're at 8.3. Had a situation Sunday night where there was quite a disturbance on Lake Menifee. It was significant. It required attention. I got into a rather heated discussion later that evening with the watch sergeant on command. He told me, and I already knew the number, but he told me that he was fortunate just to have six officers on duty. Normally he has four. He had a couple hour gap where there were six. He was four pages backlogged. Okay, 8.3, six officers, and that's, that's a good moment. That's woefully lacking at best. And this, he was very respectful to you, I'll give him that. He said, unfortunately, as much as he'd like to help, it's on you the city council in other words about eight or nine days ago a group of five teens on three street illegal vehicles assaulted one of our lake patrolmen two residents were also engaged in that activity trying to help the patrolman no officer came out to the scene in fact dispatch said it's not a priority we've got other emergencies more important wouldn't even take a report, never showed up. I have a lake manager that suffered a felony battery and the officer who did show up wouldn't do a full written report on it. I even had a, de a deputy try to challenge me on felony battery, just, just as an FYI. Maybe some of you have heard of Mr. Rob Pacheco. He was my mentoring instructor in law school. Pretty good at what he did, taught me a lot. I would offer, I know a whole lot more about felony batteries than any deputy or sergeant in the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. 
I implore you, for those that are afraid to speak because of the teens. Mr. Hendon, that's your time. And help. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, please. Diane Wayne. Uh, good evening. Uh, I have some good news for you today. I am letting you know that the work that's being done for my mother is uh, in process. I was actually amazed at how fast things happened uh, since the very first time I came here to the city council meeting. I started getting a call the next morning and then city contractors were out at my mother's house the next day. And I mean, this really amazed me because I had been waiting like a year and a half for anything to happen and just, you know, realized that I've been getting a lot of uh, lies and basically being misled about, about the work. And uh, in general, I'm, I'm happy that something is being done now, although I'm not so happy about not being able to get the roof uh, done on the current grant. We're having to reapply for the grant and hopefully get, you know, the grant uh, for the following year. So we're having to do that. And I thought we were able to get up to $10,000, but now I'm told that, you know, when we got the grant, we really didn't get up to 10000 We got something less. And I don't know how that could be because there was no assessment of the work to be done. So I do have a question about that. So overall, I feel that when your staff uses the proper guidelines, things get done as they should. Um, however, I don't think uh, that the proper guidelines are being followed. I don't think all the rules and regulations are being applied uh, adequately or equally uh, in my case. And I think that you should look into that. I was told uh, the funds were set aside for the 2000 and 2014 uh, fiscal grant year, and that's why we're able to get any work done. And as you know, it's 2015. And my mother keeps asking, when are they coming? When are they coming? <laughs> are they really going to do something? So she says she has her fingers crossed that the work will get done. That's the message that she asked me to relate today. So. I just think Menifee is a, a wonderful city and it's got great people and that all should be treated, you know, in an equal, fair manner when it comes to these uh, federal contracts and for any of the work that's coming through Menifee and that uh, I'm not sure who's, you know, looking over to see what work is being done in the city, but uh, I think they should make sure that there's a special effort to you know, review some of the work that is being done by the staff because to me, I think it's, it's amazing that this kind of work could be done so quickly now, but it wasn't done quickly a year and a half ago. And my mom was the second one to apply for the grant Diane, in October 2013. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Okay. Next speaker, please. Lisa Sobeck. Good evening, Mayor Mann and council members and uh, council member Edgerton who is here by phone. Um, I'll try to speak loud so he can hear me. Um, recently, um, I was contacted by um, the Three Peaks District of the Boy Scouts of America along with several other um, citizens to form a committee um, the reason why they reached out to me is my husband and I have been supporters of the Boy Scouts of America since our boys were cubs in the program. And what was interesting and the reason why we decided to be on this committee was um, the Three Peaks District has now recognized the city of Menifee as a wonderful place to um, hold their Distinguished Citizen Award. They are... Menifee and Hemet, San Jacinto, um, Paris are a few of the cities that are in the Three Peaks District. And they've never had this um, in our city. They've always held it in the city of Hemet. And so it's good to bring something good to the city of Menifee. And this year, um, 
the Three Peaks District has chosen Bill and Julie Zimmerman as the first Distinguished Citizen Award um, honorees. There is also a Good Scout Award that will be given to Mr. Larry Namelka. The event is on Thursday, May 28th, and I um, shared an invitation with all the city council members. The Boy Scouts um, Ward honors and recognizes individuals um, for her and her his or her commitment in the community. It's to raise awareness um, of the scouting program. It's also to raise money for the Boy Scouts of America and grow the program in the Southwest Riverside County. There are over 1,050 youth in the program in our area, over 500 adult volunteers, and there's over 10,000 hours given in a community. And we know that we will um, receive um, benefits from this program through the Eagle Scout program. They will, they will do things for our city. So I just wanted to let you know that, let you know that that was coming up May 28th. And just to give you a heads up on Minifee Better Together, our third annual Minifee Better Together is April 25th. There were 45 home applications. They raised it that we will be out cleaning up 30 homes and there will be 30 homes that will be given um, window washing as well. So there will be 60 um, homes being done and we could still use some more volunteers. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Paul Wojciechowski. Good evening, uh, council and city staff. Um, I have an announcement. Um, Greg August uh, spearheaded a uh, event that's coming up. Uh, so mark your calendars for May 7th. Um, from 8 to 9.30 a.m., we're going to be having a National Day of Prayer breakfast. It will be held at the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is located at Lazy Creek and Bradley intersection, about a mile west of here. And we're going to be cooking up some pancakes and eggs and orange juice and some fruit and different drinks. And uh, we want to invite you to come out. Uh, maybe you can spend a little time or stay the whole time, but we're going to be honoring our first responders. And I think this is very important. Um, we're going to be honoring those that serve in the police and paramedic or emergency services, as well as the fire. And um, just going to be honoring them uh, through the, the Interfaith Council and Community Service Council is supporting this event. It's actually hosting it. And we're here to uh, just honor the first responders, pray for the nation, and um, Councilman August, would you like to comment on this event as well? I, I'll, uh, I would love to um, uh, respond to it. I am uh, an honorary member of the Interfaith Council. And uh, when, um, when uh, Ferguson was going on and we're, having, we're still having some, some problems with uh, respect for the law and police officers, uh, I, I thought it would be a good idea to lend our support, community to support to, to the first responders, the fire police and EMTs and, and things like that. And uh, I come from a family of first responders and I uh, wanted to participate in this and I, I'm strongly behind it and we're encouraging everyone to come out on that morning and support our first responders. They are under an awful lot of pressure and stress and we had someone comment on uh, police officers tonight and uh, I certainly uh, understand and empathize what the gentleman was saying so it is not the easiest job in the whole world and I, I, I consider it to be one of the most difficult jobs uh, in, that the, in the country so I hope as many people as possible can come out and attend it's going to be a short event uh, I, I don't think it'll be very long, but come out and have some hotcakes with us, and there'll be some prayers, and I'll be making some uh, comments, and I'm sure uh, the mayor will as well. So please come out and support our local uh, first responders, and uh, I, I, I don't think, I think it's a great event, and I hope we get a lot of support. So thank you very much, and I'll, I'll continue to talk about this, Paul, as well, as we get closer. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting that, and I'm sure... Uh, <coughs> few of us have eaten pancakes in the past on the council, so let's come out and uh, really uh, support our city and pray uh, uh, for this country. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Tom Thurman. Good evening. My name's Tom Thurman. I live in the uh, community of uh, Sun City. I'm, I'm alarmed at what's happening in our neighborhood. Uh, here's some, some numbers I've put together. Since um, 331 2015 and the following 19 days, in my neighborhood, we had 15 calls to the police department that resulted in some, some type of action. This does not include calls that were unfounded. Here's a breakdown of the calls. One shooting, one grand theft, one burglary, two narcotics calls, two batteries, three suspicious persons, vehicles, or circumstances, and six public disturbances. This is only the calls that I'm aware of, and I'm sure there are more. Does this sound like a neighborhood that you would want to move into? What's happening to our town? What type of people are we attracting and why? Are we being targeted because it's primarily a senior area? Do we attract a, a bad element because our business section is old and run down appearing? I'm, I hope that the city is not sitting on their hands and will allocate some budget or generate some funds to help protect our entire community, not just uh, Sun City, but the entire community. We, we need some help, and it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Your Honor, the other speakers, I have one for item uh, consent agenda, item 10, and another for item 12.3, but that's all the public speakers under public comments. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> On to council member reports, Mr. August. Just a couple of quick comments. Uh, uh, Mr. Mendel is not here anymore, but I, I do also want to congratulate Mr. Leesmeyer for the work he did on the, uh, the issues we had with Lake Elsinore. But I also want to thank the staff, and I, I don't know if Mr. Mendel's here yet or not, but there was an awful lot of support from the staff and several of the council members uh, in supporting uh, Matt in doing what he was doing on that project. So I congratulate the staff for that as well. Uh, there was a lot of things going on and uh, with uh, emails going back and forth, so thanks to staff for that. For, um, I'll wait for Mr. Denver. Mr. Denver, you can uh, uh, address uh, what happened, took place at the safety meeting yesterday. You might want to make a couple of comments on our conversations with uh, Captain Judge and the police department. Lisa, I'm on that committee as well, and thank you for bringing that to our attention tonight. Um, Kay and I will be attending that, and I'll also be getting a hold of some people uh, in the, uh, out in the community and, and see if we can get some support for uh, Mr. Um, Zimmerman and his wife. And we couldn't have picked a better candidate for, for the uh, first um, citizen uh, award. So thank you very much, and we'll see. Well, our, our goal is to get 150 people there, so uh, we have our work cut out for us. So thank you very much, ma'am. Are there any other council member reports? <clears throat> Mr. Denver? Uh, the, we did have a public safety meeting. Um, it was uh, a very well attended by a number of staff and uh, citizens. Uh, we had reports from the police department. We had reports from the fire department, code enforcement, emergency services. Uh, we had animal um, control spoke and animal friends of the valley and we each it was an hour-long meeting there was a, uh, as i'm sure will be uh, said here in a second uh, there was a lot of discussion about the police issues and the costs and the some other alternatives that we might be able to do and it was a very productive meeting and it's my belief and my understanding that the safety committee has made and will continue to make recommendations to the uh, council on particularly police and fire safety issues. Thank you, Mr. Denver. Is, it, Mayor, is this time for reports? This is the time for reports. Could I just mention one other one? Yep. Real quick? Uh, yesterday, I uh, traveled to Temecula to go to a Rancho California uh, Water District Board, and the reason for the meeting uh, was uh, the, the uh, Water District was trying to figure out ways to implement the, uh, the governor's executive order, the 25% um, 
reduction per capita reduction in water use. And the reason why I went to that meeting be, is because uh, Eastern Minnesota Water Dick will be coming to the city and to the residents, our, uh, our landscapers and other people that uh, deal uh, in water. And they will be presenting a plan to all of us in the city of Minnipi on how they're going to implement the governor's executive order. And from what I heard yesterday, it's going to be fairly, probably be fairly sim similar to what Rancho uh, California Water District is going to implement in the city of Temecula. And I can tell you, and I don't want to talk about it too much right now, but it, but it was very uh, sobering. And uh, there are, is going to be some uh, conditions and restrictions uh, to come. Uh, on us citizens in the city of Menifee. So we will keep you updated on that. We will get with Eastern Municipal Water District and we'll share that information with you as soon as, as, soon as we can. Thank you. Mr. Leesmeyer. Yeah, not much of a reporting out, but I um, just want to report out that last night there was a meeting in Quail Valley um, held by the Quail Valley Community Group. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to publicly thank um, our, our senior building official, Colin McNee, and Senior Code Enforcement Officer Wayne, uh, Officer Wayne O'Gara for showing up out there. Um, they gave a lengthy um, presentation about code enforcement, talking about uh, weed abatement and some of the hot button items out there. Um, they were a little afraid that it was going to be a bloodbath because nobody really likes code enforcement, but um, it went very well. A lot of the residents out there were very happy that, uh, that they showed up, so I, I do want to thank, uh, thank them and thank Rob for letting them come out in the first place. So, thank you. Nobody likes code enforcement until you need them. Right. Uh, Mr. Edgerton, do you have anything to report out, sir? Yeah, I, um, I've been watching Greg, and he's been uh, working as the alternate on the um, on the board that I've been serving on. And I, again, I just want to continue to thank him for the great job he's doing. Um, are we going to have discussion? Uh, when do we get these discussion items? Uh, what specific discussion uh, items are you referring to? The ones um, after the consent calendar? Item 12.2. Uh, after the consent calendar. After the consent calendar, that should be coming up shortly. We're just yeah, about 12.3. 12, 12 yes. Well, I, don't, I don't have anything under this item other than to thank Greg for his continuous good service to the, uh, being the alternate on the one I usually have to serve on. All righty, thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, I have a report out from the Riverside County Transportation Commission after many, many years of uh, effort, and I think it was a total of 13 years of effort. <clears throat> the Riverside County Transportation Commission, by a vote of 23 yeses, one no, and one abstention, approved the Mid-County Parkway Freeway Project the, uh, adopted the environmental impact report and moved the project forward. This is a uh, six-lane freeway from the I-215 eastward to the San Jacinto Valley, uh, connecting 79 out in East County. It's six lanes. Uh, basically, it runs along the Ramona, the current Ramona Expressway. And uh, barring too many legal challenges, uh, that might be done by 2020. So uh, that is a $1.3 billion, <coughs> with a B, project, and that is your Measure A tax dollars throughout the county at work uh, bringing critical infrastructure uh, to me move people and goods throughout the county. Uh, that concludes my report. Um, on to the consent calendar. Madam Clerk, I believe we have a speaker on the consent calendar. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. William Bill Wright. Thank you, council members. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Edgerton? Hope so. Anyway, um, I see the council's prepared to pass this park and uh, tree uh, protection ordinance. And uh, at the last meeting, I got your two large, thick uh, documents. And I went home that evening, and I went through it all and identified the items uh, related to tree preservation and maintenance, and also others that are interesting to me. There are quite a few, and I compliment the um, committee that put it together. 
Uh, I am concerned, and I, I communicated this with Mr. Robert Lennox. Uh, some points I think were not specific enough. There was the point about tree topping, no tree topping, but there were other things related to that that could have been specifically stated. But then uh, it was referencing uh, the Arborist Associations, and I forget the initials for the associations' uh, regulations and recommendations. My question is, how is this information and requirement to perform tree services in the city in accordance with national and international arborist associations going to be implemented? How are you going to communicate with uh, tree maintenance companies? And how will you enforce that? What if a citizen notices, notices uh, improper tree maintenance? Who do we call for uh, them to be stopped? And how are you going to educate these people who have been carrying on with improper tree maintenance for many, many years? In my own particular case, in Casa Marietta, we have a tree maintenance company that's been there for over 20 years, and they really don't know how to do, how to maintain trees. I don't think they're being educated on their own, and our own board is really uneducated on proper tree maintenance. I tried to educate them and give them information, but there's considerable resistance. At the last board meeting, they basically admitted to their ignorance. So my question is to the city, how do you educate people in proper tree maintenance? Do you have a plan, and, if, and uh, do you have a plan to enforce the uh, regulations and the approved methods in the arborist associations? Do I get any comment now from the Mr. from John Mr. Lennox Mr. Johnson, or any you, council members? Mr. Johnson, can you address the issue of who, how does a citizen contact which staff member to complain about improper tree maintenance? Well, it either depends on if it's on a park maintenance uh, issue, it would go to community services, and if it's in the right of way, it would go to public works. Typically, we manage those things through our contracts. Their, our contracts would have. Uh, definite definitions and what to do's and what not to do's and then penalties if those weren't followed the, the proper way. Okay, well Thank that's, you, that's a great step forward. Now what about for... Uh, this, sir, uh, this is not a public hearing, oh. so you, you've had your time. Okay. And I'll tell you, I'll be, uh, to be honest with you, if I could have one of you two gentlemen uh, have a discussion sidebar and uh, see if we have built into our process some of the issues that he addressed hey, at a previous you, meeting. Uh, and uh, which he made some good comments, and I believe it's incorporated in the plan. I think you made sure of that. Just give him some reassurance. Sure. Do you want me to do that now or offline? Do it sidebar. Okay. No yeah. Problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, sir, very, very much. much for your concern on that. Thank you, Mr. Edgerton. Did you have a comment, sir? Mr. Edgerton, did you have a comment at this point, or? No, I don't. Okay. okay. Thank you. We are on to the uh, public hearing. Are there? Uh, Your Honor, could we adopt the con or approve the consent agenda? In a moment. I oh. believe we have a council member that would like to pull an item for separate discussion. Oh, okay. Sorry. Mr. Leesmeyer? Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, I would move approval of the of the uh, consent calendar with, uh, with, with a little bit of discussion on 10.7. Okay. 10.7 has been pulled from the consent calendar for separate discussion. May I have a motion? We have a motion to approve the balance. Is there a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. All righty, on the balance of the consent calendar, Council Member August. Aye. Council Member Leesmeyer. Aye. Council Member Edgerton. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Denver. Aye. Mayor Mann. Aye. Thank you. Council Member Leesmeyer, 10.7. Thank you. Uh, yeah, basically, just in the interest of transparency, I mean, there's a lot of times there is a lot of information on the consent calendar, and, and it appears as though we're just swooping through things. And I wanted to assure people that this stuff was getting looked at. And there are some questions that I had for our city manager. Uh, he did, however, address them. And I'm, I am confident that we have it under control. But I did want to publicly share my concerns. Um, this actually has to do with the purchasing of the fire department property or the piece of property for the future fire department. And uh, my concerns had to do with uh, maintenance. Um, typically, and, and Mr. Johnson, if you could share this, uh, my understanding is that we have the in, built into our fire contract maintenance. And on this station, we will not have that. So we need to have a plan 
how the city will handle the maintenance of this fire station is my understanding. If I'm, if I'm incorrect, please let me know. Um, also the costs, the, um, the county has a certain amount of money set aside for, for this property uh, and the construction of this. However, it's anticipated that we may not have enough money to build the station with that money. However, you've, you've done some math and done some digging around and, and we might have a, a loophole that we found, or I'm sorry, a, a stop gap, a stop gap. So if you could just talk about that and, and with that, I would move approval. Yes, thank you. Uh, currently in our contract, we have four uh, current fire stations and in our contract that we pay for for the services, the maintenance is included in that. So it's all encompassed in one uh, cost. Once this uh, facility is built, we will uh, handle the maintenance because it will be conveyed to us. It will be our actual our property. And once this one is built, the other three will then be conveyed to us as well. So the maintenance and issues that we pay for in the contract, we won't pay for through the contract anymore. We'll do it on our own. Um, we feel there could be some significant to relative insignificant uh, cost difference between us managing the maintenance of the operations of the facilities instead of the county. You know that there's an additional overhead uh, put on that for, uh, for the county that we wouldn't have. So there's a little bit of savings there. Um, the other question that you had, uh, I believe it's on the recitals page on the front, uh, talks about $3.1 million remaining from the county. There was $3.4 million to start. Uh, there was some, uh, some trade-offs, some plans, some identification of some things which, which drew that money down. Um, the approval, though, was for $3.1 million to be transferred to the city. Uh, that was a prior council uh, approval of that contract through the Board of Supervisors. We currently have um, stated in the contract that about $800,000 are going to of our own city collected DIF uh, development impact fees uh, will be used to purchase the property. Uh, we've saved about a hundred and almost two hundred and seventy thousand dollars on the purchase price of the property. The rest of the, those funds would go into uh, the building of the fire station, as well as I believe now. And Bruce can either give me a nod, or we can come back with a full report uh, next time. We, we continue to collect diff. So we had set aside eight, 800 for the, for the purchase of the property. But we continue to collect that diff, and that diff would then be able to be used uh, as additional uh, revenue stream and sources for the building of the fire station. So I don't anticipate general fund paying any of the costs of the fire station. Thank you. With that, with that I would move approval unless there's questions. Okay, we have a motion to approve agenda item 10.7. Is there a second? Second. Before I call the roll, could you ask Mr. Edgerton if he had a comment? I heard him. Yes, Mr. Edgerton, did you have a comment about item 10.7? Uh, yes, I do. And, uh, well, no, I'm sorry. I, I was questioning um, 12.7. Uh, uh, not quite point there yet. Three. Okay, we're not there yet. Okay, so. Uh, we have a motion and a second on agenda item 10.7. Call the roll, please. Okay, on the motion to approve item 10.7 separately on the consent agenda. Council Member Edgerton? Uh, aye. Council Member August? Aye. Council Member Lise Meyer? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Denver? Aye. Mayor Mann? Aye. Thank you. We have no public hearings this evening. That brings us to our discussion items. Agenda item 12.1, accept fiscal year 2014-15 mid-year budget review and approve presented budget adjustments. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor members of the council, uh, Bruce Foltz, your finance director, will have a break presentation for you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, city council. I'd like to present the mid-year uh, financial review for fiscal year 2014-15. Um, just want to do a little overview, uh, kind of remind your, you and the audience uh, our general fund revenues make up roughly 71% of our total revenues. And um, current year total budgeted revenues for this physical year that we're in is 39.7 million. Um, of that, as, as I mentioned, 71% makes up the general fund. Um, we have gas tax makes up 6%, measure A, 4%, um, impact fees, as well as uh, special revenues and grant revenue. The three primary funds that um, the general fund measure and gas tax represents um, really our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, gas tax is used for road construction maintenance as well as our um, general fund is for public services. 
And so I just want to go over that. And, um, you know, last year, or excuse me, two months ago, I was presenting last year's financial figures, and we had a phenomenal year last year. Um, all of our property tax revenues were up, up from the prior year. Our sales tax was up. Our um, development fees were um, phenomenal compared to the year before. Those, um, when I say development fees, are our building plant, building permit fee, permitting fees. And um, so we went into this fiscal year very optimistic, um, thinking that um, based on last year, we would increase those revenues. And for the most part, looks like we were on target for a few items. There were a couple items a little concern I want to go over. So looking at the general fund itself, we budgeted 27 point, almost $6 million for the, at the beginning of the year. Looking at property tax, we budgeted $10 million. Um, throughout the year, we received various funding streams of property tax. Um, when I say funding streams, this represents the secured property tax, the unsecured, the teeter settlement, um, prior supplemental, current year supplemental, and various items that we received throughout the year um, come in within the first six months. And so the financial statements here, when we're looking at year-to-day actual, that actually represents the first eight months. Um, since we are doing the uh, mid-year adjustment here, a little late in the year, uh, I added a, a few more months instead of just the first six months of the year. So within property tax, there are several items that come in within the first six months that um, w once we receive it, uh, there's no more funding for, more, for those line items. And two in particular that came in is the teeter settlement that we received in October. Uh, we budgeted roughly $300,000, we uh, came in um, about $90,000 short. And then the unsecured property tax, we budgeted again another 300,000 and that came in almost 100,000 short. However, we did receive extra supplemental um, property tax within the first six months of roughly $25,000 higher than expected. So the net of those three items together is roughly um, $165,000. So I'm recommending that we adjust our property tax revenues down by $165,000. Sales tax looks like it's trending um, adequately. I believe it will meet our target of um, $5.7 million. Um, franchise fees seem to be coming in. Um, if you look on the far right, it does say that we're at 28% actual to date. Um, two primary factors there. The, we received franchise fees from the gas company as well as from the utility company. Um, we received one large payment for both of those in the month of April. And so since this is through the first eight months of the year, those funds have not come in yet, but I believe based on preliminary figures that I've, I've seen so far, we are on target to meet our franchise fees or maybe slightly over. Um, development fees is a little area is one area that I'm a little concerned in, um, and I'll go into a little more detail in the next couple of slides. Uh, we went into the year um, pretty optimistic, and based on the preliminary figures that I've seen for through the first really eight months of the year, um, I, I don't believe we're going to quite make our target. So that's why I'm recommending that we um, modify this down seven hundred thousand um, dollars. Two years ago, we were kind of in the same situation. Um, went to mid-year adjustment, and we actually made a $1.1 million adjustment down on the same line item of development fees. Uh, and that was due to, um, we had two prior years that were really good, and then a drop off. And then other revenues, uh, they seem to be trend trending uh, on target. So I want to go into a little bit into the building permits. So I have a little bit of a history here, uh, going back to um, fiscal year 2010 to the current so in 2010, we had um, 1,684 permits issued. The next year, it increased by 10%. Um, in 2012, it actually had a drop, um, drop of 28%. And then we had another increase in 2013, really actually doubled the number of permits issued. Um, 2014, um, had a phenomenal year, um, increased. As you know, as you may see on the far right column, I have revenues associated um, in 2013-14, we actually implemented new fees, and so the revenue um, increased substantially. And so, again, through the first eight months of the year, we've collected, um, or we've issued um, 1,613 permits. 
So this is the same information on a bar graph. So you can see going back, we had two good years, then it dropped off, um, another two, two good years, and then um, again reflecting the first eight months of this year. Um, I do expect it to go up, but I don't expect it to go up quite as high as last year. So digging down a little bit deeper into building permits, I have um, the current year activity in the, in the bottom here in, in the blue, last year's activity there in the middle, kind of a pink color, and the prior year in the green. If we just focus on last year's um, fiscal year 13, 14, I have the columns across the top as being each month um, and the year to date for that particular year just below it. Um, going from July of 2013, that um, 316 permits were issued. Then in August it dropped. September it was up. Um, October it increased again. November it dropped and so forth. So um, it's very difficult to predict where we're going to go with building permits. It's um, kind of like herding cats. I mean, the numbers are all over the board. Um, we do expect building permits to increase. There's a lot of development on the horizon, but to really pinpoint exactly how many uh, building permits will issue in any particular month or within any particular year, it's a little difficult. But um, uh, I, I don't think, unfortunately, we will be quite as good as we did last year, but I am hoping and kind of optimistic that we will get to where we were two years ago. And the reason I say that, because I just did a little survey of local area and took, um, this is through um, Zillow.com, and um, kind of looking at historical prices of homes, um, those are single family residential homes, and comparing to the local communities, our San Diego, city of San Diego and Orange County and Temecula. And if you look down the Menifee column there to 2015, and this is numbers from year to year for the month of April. Um, I think Menifee itself is a very attractive home prices. I, um, I am surprised that more compared to the other um, areas on this chart, that more people are knocking at the door to, to live here because these are very attractive prices. I think we have a very nice community. We have a lot to offer here. And so I'm very optimistic that um, we're just in a little lull right now. The building permits, based on the, the prior slide, or prior two slides, um, it's kind of cyclical. It goes up and down. And um, we're in a little bit of a lull right now, but I believe le next year will, will be up, and um, at, le at least probably as much as um, in 2012-13. Mr. August. Uh, yes, Mr. Fultz. Uh, the, I, uh, and this question is for anybody on the staff. Does any, rather than the real estate market being kind of cyclical, uh, cyclical, um, does anybody on the staff have any idea why the building permits might be down uh, other than it's just uh, the time of year? And they, they seem to me to be a little bit significantly down. And if they do not get better, uh, I know this is hard for you to estimate, what kind of, would that be something for us to be concerned about at the end of the year? Mr. Johnson? Uh, I don't know about the end of the year, but uh, if you can look at back at the trending of, of what we're doing, we, we, we haven't really done much trending uh, before. Bruce brought that to us, and, and it's a really good tool to use. If you can see, though, we're actually trending up, so it's two years up, one year down, two years up, one year down, uh, and, and we believe that will continue. We do have, as Bruce mentioned, and we've talked about numerous times, 83 or some projects on the books right now coming through, so we don't see the number of building permits uh, um, stopping, we see them maybe moving ahead slower, and it is cyclical in the building industry. I'm sure uh, those of you that have worked in there, in that industry, uh, can understand that. Um, not too concerned, but now that we know and we see a pattern, we should be uh, better at estimating our budgets for that. But but these aren't just excuse me, these, these are not just uh, single family housing permits. These are all building permits total permits, correct, in the city. For all functions, not just single family. Correct, but the biggest has been single family residents. Okay. And also, uh, another question the median of $316,000 median price, that was for new homes, not existing, no, existing homes and new homes. Um, the data I had received was the um, um, just home sales in general, new and used. 
Pardon me, sir? Uh, the, this slide here represents home sales in general, both new development and um, existing homes and combined. And that would be $316,000 for Menifee? Yes. Okay, and uh, other qu well, last question. I've seen some email traffic that uh, somewhere the state of California is getting involved in what is going to result in a reduction uh, in the gas tax next year. Do you know any, have heard anything about that? Yes, um, preliminary figures that we've received from the um, state controller's office. Um, gas tax will be down next year. The, the board uh, approved a reduction in the excise tax This is associated with a gas tax. Um, it looks like we will be down roughly $700,000 next year. That represents roughly a 25% drop in um, gas tax revenue compared to this year. So those are um, something that we'll be looking at in more detail when we prepare the budget for next year. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. I, I do know that there's a, a new bill going through transportation bill for the state of California. I believe it's Senator Bell, Beal, Bell, B-E-A-L. Uh, that's being proposed. I was at a league function on Friday and, and the Transportation, Public Works and Communications Policy Committee uh, voted recommend approval for that and voted support for that. Uh, it is a gap a gap bill which would then restore what we'd lost and uh, bring about 1.6 to $3 billion in the next five years for state transportation uh, projects to be split 50-50 between the state, the cities and counties. So even though yes, currently there's going to be a dip in that, I believe that's going to be backfilled for the next hopefully five years. It's a five-year bill. Who has to sign that? Well, your friend and mine, Governor Brown, ultimately. Okay. So let me get let me let me get this straight. We government has regulated the auto industry to the point where we made fuel efficient cars because that was the mandate and the automobile industry responded, made more fuel efficient vehicles. People are driving more, they're selling more cars. Population in the county is increasing, but yet the gas tax revenue is going down. And so what is government's answer? Let's uh, add another tax to replace the money that we're losing because government made the industry get more efficient and it's hurting everybody and there's a, it's going to be a tough solution. Are these gas tax revenues, are they restricted dollars or are those general fund dollars? No, those are restricted strictly so, for roads okay. and maintenance. Yes, yeah, not for general fund. Um, with, what's the data point? I miss your, your source data on these prices. Um, that was off of Zillow.com and um, it was from April each each year on April, for the month of April. Even though we're, we're in April right now, it's not the full month, um, basically from April 14th. You, you know these matters better than I, but Mr. Johnson, I would suggest that we use um, our local resource for this, the monthly real estate report that we get from uh, Gene Wonderlich, Ivar, Sarkar. I would venture to say that it's actually more accurate and it's more, um, the regional aspect of this is dialed in probably better. Agree. Just I'll as share as that with Mr. Fultz. Okay. Thanks. Um, just a short overview of the general fund expenditures. Um, last year or this year, um, looks like most items are trending as normal. There's one item I wanted to make an adjustment for was in public works and engineering is to remove um, basically one position that was in um, the general fund over to gas tax as more appropriate um, to be associated with gas tax is um, the position that fundamentally the traffic engineering and um, overseeing the um, street maintenance and so forth. So that one position would be moved over to the general fund, but all other expenditures, um, no other further adjustments um, would be needed. Um, it looks like uh, we're trending as planned if you look at the both police and fire, uh, the percentage year to date, they are a little bit low. The police were missing um, one month of, um, of invoices. And then for fire, we are billed on a quarterly basis, so we only have one quarter there. Um, they tend to bill a little bit behind, and so we're missing three quarters of the year. Um, continuing on to the general fund, overall um, making $115,000 reduction in expenditures and transferring that over to the gas tax fund. And as you can see for the year to date in the far right column, um, for the first eight months, we are 46% of where we expected to be um, on our expenditures. 
and that's mostly reason reason it's low is due to the fire contract, um, the second quarter payment, as well as a one month um, payment for the police services. Um, looking at the gas tax, um, we have received preliminary figures for this fiscal year that we will get an increase of two hundred twenty thousand um, dollars from the state controller's office, and that will raise our um, total revenues for gas tax of two point seven million. And then I'm recommending that we recognize an increase in expenditures for that one position, and that would be $115,000. So a net increase to the gas tax, which would be revenue minus expenses of $205,000, $205,000 um, for the fiscal year. Um, measure A is um, half a cent of sales tax that we receive, which is also designed for um, road maintenance. Um, I'd, do not currently have any recommendations for adjustments. We seem to be trending as, as we should be. The and gas tax, or excuse me, the Measure A revenues are in line and so are our expenditures. And then um, just a summary of the mid-year adjustments. Reduce the property tax roughly um, $164,926 due to the reduction in um, property tax that we've already seen, uh, a reduction in building permits, $700,000 in the general fund, um, increased gas tax revenues of $320,000, and then transfer $115,000 from the general fund to um, the gas tax for salaries and benefits for that one position that I mentioned earlier. And um, that concludes my presentations. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to help to answer. Mr. August? Mr. August? Yeah, quick question, Mr. Fowles. At the, the last time you briefed us, uh, you said that uh, last year was a very good year. And uh, since we're talking about trends tonight, in light of all the information you pr presented tonight, um, how would you say we're looking, what are the prospects for next year? For next year? Uh, well, we're, we're getting into the very beginning part of, of budgeting for next year. So I really haven't analyzed that far into next year. But a comment about this year, um, I, th I think we're, we're in line, except for building permits, that's the only area of a little bit of concern, hence the recommendation for reduction in the um, total revenue. Um, overall, it looks like we're trending as we had expected going into the budget. I think um, based on the prior year, um, you know, we, we tend to expect that as we build more houses, there's more property tax revenue, mm -hmm. that the revenues coming in would be higher um, each year, and they seem to be trending. Yeah. Um, like I said, the unsecured property tax, which is based on um, property, which is like boats, planes, or uh, fixed assets within a building for a business, those um, looks like we were a little optimistic on that. So those are a little bit harder to define. But um, overall, I think we're doing very well this year. Um, not quite as um, prosperous as last year, but again, you know, the, the housing market is cyclical, and I believe it will be up next year. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there a motion to um, approve the budget adjustments as presented? I'll move. Motion by Mr. Leesmeyer. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. August. Do you need a roll call vote, or is this just? Yes, sir, I do. Yep, because, okay, uh, call the roll, please. Thank you. Uh, voting on the acceptance of the fiscal year mid-year budget review and approved presented budget adjustments. Council Member Leesmeyer. Aye. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Denver. Aye. Council Member August. Aye. And Council Member Edgerton. Aye. And Mayor Mann. Aye. Thank you. On to agenda. Thank you, Mr. Foles. On to agenda item 12.2, approve proposal for summer schedule for all city meetings. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, you had asked us to look into a uh, recommendation of possibly going dark in one of the months of summer to allow for uh, some vacation time for staff and for uh, since actually since our residents and community are typically off, they're off at vacation as well. So uh, we looked into that. We we're recommending uh, if, if council should consider that for uh, July to be that month. And uh, that would be to go dark for council uh, commissions and committees. Um, there would be uh, no uh, meetings the month of July. 
Does this require at a future agenda item change the code or anything or um, or? We, yes, with approval uh, tonight from you and direction, we would bring that back at a separate time. I believe it would be a consent item. Uh, well, if it's an ordinance, it would be, yeah. We, we'll, we'd go through the proper channels to make it happen. Okay, thanks. Is there any discussion on this item? Hearing no objection, I believe that's the unan uh, unanimous consent to proceed uh, to bring that back. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. And I think that's the right thing to do. A lot of agencies do that, and I think... Um, with as many months as we have, five weeks, we can actually add another meeting or two as needed. But uh, I think this is the right thing to do to give everybody, you know, a break. <clears throat> On to agenda item 12.3, review of planning commission requirements for allowing multi-generation suites in single-family residential homes. Um, do we have a public speaker on this, Madam Clerk? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you for asking. Would you like me to call him now? Um, Mr. Johnson, would you prefer to make the a report first and then take the speaker? I would, just in case we answer any questions that might come up from the speaker, they could get that information first. Or, it, but it, if it pleases the council, we'll take the speaker first. In this case, let's take the staff report first. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, this is an item that I uh, was asked by yourself to bring to, to council last uh, council meeting and ask for uh, an agenda item, which was granted. Um, Bob Brady can give um, a brief update as to what the Planning Commission approved, but what we're talking about is a multi-generational family unit uh, concept by uh, Lennar um, that went through the Planning Commission itself and was approved without an exterior door for the actual uh, next-gen unit. Um, in a little bit of research that we've done since we asked to bring this topic back, um, the product was approved by by the Planning Commission, uh, but there are, are some of these units in town already that were approved by the, by the county. Uh, D.R. Horton has a mahogany tract on Lindenberger and Simpson, and there are, there are next-gen units in there with an exterior door for the next-gen unit. And there are some units out at Audie Murphy Ranch, and Bob, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's Big Sky uh, by Brookfield, and uh, that was a county approved as well. So um, it, it seemed to be a matter of, uh, of keeping a level playing field. Uh, for us, anyway, for staff. Uh, but again, it's a policy decision, so we wanted to make sure that council had an opportunity to talk about that policy decision. And Bob, um, I'm going to throw it to you for a second. Uh, community uh, Services, sorry, Community Development uh, Director, if you can provide any additional background or, or maybe I'd be on standby for questions, however you'd like to do that, Mayor. Um, but uh, Bob, if you could add some additional light, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, member of the City Council. Just a brief background. In February of 2014, the Planning Commission did consider plans proposed by Lennar uh, to include a 969 square foot multi-generational uh, suite as an option in a 3,153 square foot home in their Menifee Hills project. And at that time, the Planning Commission had uh, approved seven requirements to allow the multi-generational suites to be constructed as part of that project and I'll go through those real quickly. The first was a what they call a universal design basically so people can age in place the um, uh, accessibility types of uh, um, design that goes into the to the building. Um, a single meter for each of the utilities serving that particular home. Uh, it would also prohibit garage conversions um, to bedroom or living space uh, prohibit the separate exterior access door to the suite. Uh, at that time, they only allow one laundry facility. Uh, prohibit a full kitchen facility, such as a range oven. And uh, lastly, uh, if the project wasn't a specific plan, the requirement was that the plan would have to be amended as part of that approval process. After the uh, February 2014 Planning Commission review, Lennar decided not to move forward with their suites at that time. In December of 2014, Lennar did submit a new application for a smaller 476 square foot multi-generational suite uh, in a 2,863 square foot uh, home. The Planning Commission reviewed this proposal on March uh, 11th of this year. And during the 11th, March 11th review, the Planning Commission did modify their previously approved requirements by eliminating the single laundry facility requirement and the requirement for a specific plan amendment. They would essentially find it, or we, the city would find it in conformance with the uh, existing development requirements. While uh, Lennar was appreciative of the commission's decision to eliminate those two requirements from the list, 
They also asked the commission to reconsider allowing the access door to the, uh, to the exterior for the suite. Uh, the planning commission at that time considered it, but did not modify the requirement uh, to prohibit the exterior uh, door access into the suites. Uh, subsequently, Lennar submitted an application to appeal the planning commission requirements. However, the application was filed after the uh, filing deadline. Uh, so in closing, the, the proposal, as Mr. Johnson indicated, th these uh, types of suites, it is consistent with other home builders uh, that are constructing uh, new homes such as Brookfield and DR, and they offer the similar type of uh, multi-generational suite. Uh, with that, uh, it concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Um, Mr. August, do you have a question of staff? I do. Okay. I have a couple questions from staff. Mr. Brady, uh, I'll, take a, I'll direct them towards you first. I think you said that the Planning Commission removed the specific plan requirement, which would be for single family homes with a substantial uh, conformance. What the commission had done was that uh, they made the finding that um, the, the specific plan, if the, if the home was located or the project was located in a specific plan, they would not be required then to uh, amend the specific plan, which is, can be a costly process, okay. and so that we could find that in substantial conformance uh, with the specific plan requirements. And then the substantial conformance is basically what it's uh, suggesting or stating is that this is not a multi-family uh, dwelling, correct? Correct. And this is, this is a s single family? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, what about the laundry room? The, uh, initially, um, the proposal uh, that Lennar had was for uh, a laundry room in the main, for the main home, or the main, the, uh, and then within the suite mm -hmm. itself, had the stackable type of a, a laundry facility, either in a closet or in the, in the bathroom, some, you know, some of the location. What the commission did then was said, you know, that would be okay to have both in both uh, locations. Okay, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you don't know whether or not there's 220 electrical for the unit or any, I, that's really not important. What about water meters? Uh, one water meter on these units, one gas Correct. line? Okay, that's all I have for uh, right now, thank you. Oh, one other question, um, appeal. Uh, because of uh, number four, the entry exit door, on, in, in a normal situation, would that require, or would an appeal on the builder be appropriate? Would they have to appeal what the planning commission, uh, what their request was, what their request to the builder was? The planning commissions, then these are the seven requirements, and that's not, by not allowing that exterior doorway, um, that is something that the commission had adopted as one of the requirements. They then were, uh, that was their primary concern. Lennar indicated they would not be able to, or did not want to go forward with these units if they did not have that exterior door. And so that was the primary reason that they wanted to appeal uh, that, one re that one particular requirement of the planning commission. So uh, an appeal, the appeal process was the normal process for Lennar to uh, pursue. That would have been the process because planning commission took action on it. The next process then would be to appeal it or that action to the city council. Yeah, because there was some confusion on my part because people keep saying, well, the project was approved with the caveat or the exception of item number four, and that confuses me a little bit. So in your opinion, was it approved or wasn't it approved? The, the multi-generational suite, the, the planning commission um, supported the concept of that with those seven requirements. Mm -hmm. And one of the requirements is not to allow or have that exterior door. So mm -hmm. the, the concept of the multi-generational units is not an issue. It's that exterior access is the primary concern. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions of the council? Okay, uh, call the speaker, please, Madam Clerk. Jeff Clemens. Jeff Clemens, 980 Montecito, Corona, uh, Representative Lennar, uh, Mayor, members of the council, thank you very much for taking this up. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly just to the fact that Lennar was one of the first builders that ventured into trying to provide housing and homes for, mo excuse me, oh, sorry, provide homes for multi-generational uh, living that people are doing nowadays. We spent over six months developing and researching what those needs were. 
Uh, we've been building multi-generational homes or next-gen homes uh, in the Inland Empire for the past four years. Uh, we've built about 600 plus homes in that time frame. Uh, we feel that there, we feel very passionately about the specific requirements for the next gen. And speak to your point, we actually made the mistake of not appealing in time. Uh, we should, we thought it was 10 working days and uh, my staff made a mistake. So I'll apologize for that and we'll go through whatever process is necessary. Um, but that was just it. It was just kind of coming to speak to the fact that we feel it's much needed in the city of Menifee. Um, this type of homes or this kind of housing actually provides an additional type of choice for people. And back to the building permits, last year was a bit tough on the, on the sales uh, for all of us in all the area. Uh, we're starting to have a good sales year, so hopefully that's starting to pick up. Uh, we've had a really good January through April, so just on the projections there, so hopefully it's all good there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? No, sir. Thank you. Um, so I guess the, the, the item on the agenda for consideration is to really whether to allow the exterior door um, modifying the condition of approval number four um, as adopted by the planning commission so is there any other is there any discussion from the council perspective on this mr august I, 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 I would like oh excuse me mr. Mayor. i kind of like some information from and let me let me get an idea where we're going on the council thing do you expect at the end of the evening that this council is going to approve the multi generational house for Lenar. Is that where this council is going tonight? It's already been approved that the issue is whether to modify condition number four to allow the exterior door on okay. the suite. All right. That's the, the only that's the only issue. Okay. Let's on say one very specific project. If the door and the entry gets approved by this council, does that mean that uh, the, the it has been approved? That product has been approved. <coughs> In other words, you're going to send it to staff. Can they start uh, building the project? I'll defer to the city attorney on if, if the council if the council were to give for, let me do, I believe there's no there doesn't require any other formal process other than the council giving the city manager the uh, administrative authority to make that modification is that is that correct that's that is I should stop at yes but I'll go a little bit further um, the ultimately what the council is doing is it's issuing a policy decision and the policy decision is that it's going to allow exter exterior doors on next generation units if that's if that's the the ultimate prerogative of the council of course um, if that determination is made then the staff would be empowered to administratively move forward and allow exter exterior units on the Lennar project exterior doors to the next-gen units on the Lennar project o only on the Lennar project only on the Len right. Lennar project if future projects will come in and they be get they get uh, they get their time of the day they go through the process and they'll be determined one-on-one -on -one. that's right mr. August I got a uh, this is a kind of an interesting question to me but what it looks like what we've done Sorry, and I'm not problem. saying it's intentional on the Sorry, part of the mayor or anyone is that you've allowed the developer to uh, uh, escape uh, an appeal process, okay? And, uh, and allow him to come up for an administrative for a decision from the council and proceed forward with his project. And to me, what that can lead to, if that's gonna be a uh, precedent, if we're setting a precedent, then these people on the planning commission, uh, any decision they make, uh, the developer can miss the uh, the uh, period, the appeals period, and come up, contact one of the council people here, put it on the agenda, and administratively, we can bypass whatever the planning, planning commission does. Is this a default, can this be a default position? The reality in this situation, Councilman August, is that the, that the city council is the superior policy-making body in the city, and it has in its prerogative the ability to, to make this kind of decision even outside of the appeal process, because we, we find ourselves at that at that doorstep tonight. Now, a question: If you were a developer, and uh, you were going against what the planning commission decided, wouldn't it be beneficial for them just to miss the ap appeals period and bring it up and and go for what we're going through tonight? Wouldn't it be to their advantage to do that? I would not counsel a developer to take that step, and here's why. Um, if a developer feels that they've been aggrieved by a decision of a of a planning commission 
uh, they, it is incumbent on them to exhaust their administrative remedies with the city before they could ever take that decision to a higher authority, to, to court, for example. Um, and so if they miss the appeal period, then they will not have exhausted their administrative remedies, and that is the end of the, uh, end of the line for them if they wanted to seek relief in court one day. On the other hand, so for example, in this process, if the council tonight decides as a matter of policy that it doesn't want to proceed and in, 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 in isn't interested in allowing exterior doors on this unit, there's no remedy left for, for the Lennar entity other than to go back and make a new application. They, won't, they, are, they aren't going to be able to sue this city for its decision to approve or not approve the action that is before it tonight. So from, from the developer's perspective, if I, was, if I was the developer and I were interested in preserving my remedies, I would absolutely file a timely appeal. And I think that's, that's why the representative from Lennar mentioned that it was their mistake and that they would go through whatever, whatever process they ultimately had to. I hope that helped. Thank you. Uh, it, it can be done, though, that essentially, uh, well, my question was, it was uh, it's in the writings here and on the agenda that whether or not it goes back to the Planning Commission, but I'm not interested in seeing it go back to the Planning Commission. That wouldn't be my favor. I would just, I'm just trying to preserve the, uh, the status and, and the reasoning and the purpose of the Planning Commission here because I think it's been usurped or diverted. Uh, we've, we've gone around it tonight. I, I would offer this, this thought, which is that I wouldn't encourage a process like this. I think it doesn't, it, 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 it may make sense in this, in this instance under these, under these facts and given what's happened in this case, but I think if I was uh, from a developer's perspective, once I have found myself outside of the process that the code specifically makes me, uh, gives, gives to me, then I've, I've put myself at risk in a way that most developers don't want to do in front of a city. Oh, thank you. And uh, one, sir, one question for a uh, city manager and yourself, if you know the answer to this, Mr. Mayor. Has a city, I, I don't believe they have since uh, my term on the city council, but has this council ever discussed, it, as far as you know, when you go back farther than us, Mr. Mayor, uh, the relevancy uh, of multi-generational house, multi housing for the city of Menifee? Have we ever had a discussion on that. The council. I, I absolutely believe that. Can I? Can we dial me down a little bit? Because this guy got river rich. I, I absolutely believe this council has had that discussion, and it was unanimously adopted in the general plan on December 18th of 2013 when we approved the Vision 2020 statement mm -hmm. of our general plan, which says that we will, going forward, as we develop this city, we will have various housing product types to meet the market demands of our residents going I, forward and mm -hmm. to me um, you know wh whether you like multi-gen housing or not to me is irrelevant I, I think it's a matter of uh, of uh, fairness in terms of the product already exists in the city mm -hmm. with exterior doors mm -hmm. and you know I think it's a good I, I think it's good for us to go through this right now because then I think the message on the street will be you need to file a timely appeal mm -hmm. number one yes, sir, number sir. two um, I also think that the Planning Commission will say, okay, gee, well, the Council has made a policy decision and the Council reminded us of Vision 2020 in the general plan, which says to provide various housing products in the city. So from my perspective, allowing exterior doors on 15 units in a 200-unit housing project doesn't detract from anything in the city. Okay. Um, to, to your point, Mr. Mayor, various housing projects uh, does, does not mean to me multi-generational housing Does it can mean a, it maybe it means it to you but it doesn't necessarily it, but my point was I have never voted on multi-generational housing and mr. Uh, our city manager said the county approved it before and I, I, I don't want to get in a, uh, an argument with you I, my only point is I don't think the council has ever had a discussion on the product multi-generational housing and that's my only point yeah that's a very valid project uh, <coughs> That's a very valid point, and I think that uh, going forward, I think that uh, the development community, as they develop their business models and they bring their projects forward that are consistent with the general plan and our development code, and they go through the staff vetting process, they go to the planning commission, they come to the council, you're, we're all going to have a crack at the multi-generational housing uh, question, assuming that they come back forward, somebody comes with another project someday. Um, 
I kind of shared my thoughts with that, with the 2020 vision. So I, I have nothing else really to discuss about this. Mr. Denver, you got your light on. Thank you, I do. Um, we have two issues here. One is um, the, the door, and the second is uh, multi-generational housing. Trust me when I say there's numerous houses, whether built or not, that have multi-generational families in them. I lived in one uh, before the one I live now, and, and uh, matter of fact, uh, I had my wife's uh, family with us for a year in our present house. And the, co and the main thing here is, let's get this settled about this door on these 15 homes. This isn't a major issue. Um, you have to have a door, in my opinion, on these kinds of uh, multi-generational things. And we ended up putting one in because people come in and out, nurses come in and out, and you really don't want them coming through your bedroom or, or however it goes. So I'm, I'm making a motion that we go ahead and approve this with the door and let's get this one out of the way and let's recommend once again to the to the city count or to the staff that to, and to the developers that they don't miss their opportunity for a um, a, um, a a change you know that they went appeal and that they get that done correctly but let's get this one over with it's no big deal does that motion mr melching satisfy the direction to staff as as mr denver related yeah, I, I, if I could reframe the motion or Please. try and frame the motion, the motion the motion would be to approve the item that is uh, that is item twelve point three on the agenda with a direction to staff to implement that item with respect to the project. Okay. That's my motion. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'd like to speak to the item. Uh, Mr. Edgerton would like to speak to the. Item. Okay, I would like to take. I would like to obtain a second before we take additional comment from the council. I don't want to have any I don't want to have any more debate while we're while we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second on that motion? I would second. We have a motion and a second. Go ahead, Mr. Edgerton. Yes, um, I'm going to support the developer on this project in that I believe that hopefully the motion will say you know they have determined the way they want to build it. And we let them build it the way they want to build it. This is a particular type of project. Uh, we're talking about Lamar here, are we not? Yes. Yes. And the premium builder across the U.S. Uh, they're familiar with this project. They know what sells and what does not. I had a meeting with them and uh, did not accept what they wanted in total. Uh, when they felt I had enough for, you know, to stop it or make it go. So they took a walk. So any attempt to modify what they have, if, even if you're successful, is essentially a no vote. So either you're for it or you're against it. It's black and white. Uh, my uh, experience with these guys, they were professional. They knew what they were doing, and uh, they knew what they wanted, and it comes down again to the old cultural thing. I have a, a daughter who lives in Boulder, Colorado. They love the ambience. It's a college town, and uh, we could have the same thing for part of this town. You know, some people prefer more space, as I do. Some like the uh, advantage that these various uh, kinds of living situations offer. Now, there's another factor here. Economics has imposed upon us uh, some of this multi-generational living that wasn't there before. And uh, so I think I'm, I'm supportive of a motion that is a very broad policy issue that doesn't admit that one developer uh, these guys are professional, they're appropriate, they do good work. Uh, I don't want to, I was not with them 100% before, but I am now. And uh, I'm going to support the motion because I think we need to, to clarify our policies rather than the specific development. And I think uh, it sends the wrong message 
to go after this specific developer when we really should be going after a broader uh, policy. And I think, uh, as I read the tea leaves out there in the community, it's pretty tight, but there are more people in the community that are um, willing to accept this kind of life, uh, both from the standpoint of choice and or because they appreciate there are people out there who are in an economic position where they need this kind of choice. And uh, so I'm, I'm, going, I'm going from there, and I just, I'm sure both the developer and other people will think that I may have changed my mind. I have not as far as my own choices. But as far as what is fair, as far as what is in the best interest of Menifee, uh, if you got a top-notch developer that comes along, they have a good product. Uh, let's go up or down on it and move on. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm supporting this project, and that's a little the history of why. Thank you, Mr. Edgerton, for your comments. Is there any other discussion amongst the council? We have a motion and a second on the floor. Hearing none, call the question. Thank you. To approve item 12.3 with direction to staff to implement. Council Member Edgerton. Uh, the motion again, to read back to me. Approve item 12.3 with direction to staff to implement. Right. So we are not going to follow Planning Commission's suggestion here. We're going to proceed and allow an hour to build it the way they want to build it, right? With the outside door, that is correct. My vote is yes. Thank you. Council Member Ogden. I'm going to vote no, and with the, uh, with, uh, if the mayor would just allow me, I'll give you a couple of minutes. Uh, I will, will tell you why I'm going to vote no well, tonight. Well, no, hang on just a second. Yes, sir. I'm going to allow it sure, thank this you. time, yeah. but Robert's rules and our decorum, when we have a motion and we have a second, and I call for end of debate, you, that, that's when you should make your statement. So in the future, if you would please, okay. make it at that time. Thank okay. you. Okay, go, go ahead. Okay, uh, multi-generational housing to Lennar Homes, and I see you in the back of the room. I have visited your homes in Temecula, Mr. Edgerton, and I took it, and they're very, very nice, and uh, I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit. So I do understand the reasoning behind the marketing of the multi-generational home to consolidate multiple generations under one roof allow families that may still be struggling with the effects of job and financial loss uh, to pool their financial resources and, and they do offer benefits uh, to adult children to come in, take care of their parents, or parents take care of their children, child care, adult care, savings on the rising cost in operation and maintenance of owning a home. They defer personal expenses, unanticipated delayed retirements as well as marketing a strong Southern California cultural preference within some difficult demographics in the Los Angeles area. On and on it goes. There are many, many, many positive things about your, your product. Multi-generational homes do serve a purpose, as I said, but the same can be said for the non-multi-generational homes. Lennar, in my opinion, is marketing to a demand out of necessity, not the preferred lifestyle that most in Menifee share and want. Some suggest once the economy turns around, the standard nuclear family will again return, will, be, uh, will again return as the preferred arrangement for families. Some predict that by the end of the decade, conditions will render multi-generational living a wave of the past where these multi-generational residences will be converted to multiple family residences. I want to commend Lennar for making significant changes to their multi-generational suites since initially bringing them before the council many months ago. Tonight, I believe that we're discussing what is the separate entry exit feature in the suite that was disapproved by the commission. It will pass, I'm sure. As I understand it, the, it was the planning commissioner's primary concern that the separate entry exit is the potential 
is a potential for it becoming a totally separate unit with a high potential for becoming a rental enterprise that could lead to unrest in the neighborhood due to parking traffic noise, higher density pockets, not to mention environmental and health concerns. It is true that non-multi-generational homes or multi-generational homes without the entry exit feature can bring the same problems to a neighborhood. But the multi-generational unit is a ready-made rental product. I see it in my neighborhood in Sun City with room conversions and added entries and exits and garages full of everything except cars. Residents are becoming more and more concerned as what were once single family homes are now becoming multi-family homes. My deepest concern is for the balance, the stability, harmony, peace, quality, quiet, and tranquility of our Menifee neighborhoods. It's hard enough without adding additional distractions. While multi-generational housing may work in some cities such as Temecula or Marietta where the tax base is much higher, those cities stand a much better chance of ensuring these multi-generational dwellings don't slide off the rails and become a blight in our neighborhoods in the city of Menifee. I would go further than the Planning Commission and not allow multi-generational housing into our city at this time. If the council, and I'm sure they will tonight, uh, approve uh, uh, the uh, multi-generational product, I strongly suggest that the CCNRs be vigorously vetted and strongly written to control and ensure that these homes are not allowed to become a source of frustration, discord, and disharmony in our community. They need to be strictly enforced. And thank you for allowing me to make those comments, Mr. Mayor. I don't think there's a. I don't think this project has an HOA, so there won't be any CCNRs. But uh, you know. If, if, if I buy a product, if I buy one of these homes and I have my parent come in and live or if I have a college age student return and they live there for five or six years and then they move out, last time I looked, this is America, I can do what I want with my house. So can we finish the roll please? Yes, sir. Council Member Lee Smyer. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Denver. Aye. Mayor Mann. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, staff, for that uh, effort and that uh, staff report, and thank you, council, for the discussion. It was a healthy discussion. I think it needed to be had, and I think we'll probably have another one in the future along that same topic. Um, on to agenda item 12.4. I don't believe there's a staff report. This is mine. Um, this, is a, this is on here because we had not appointed a SCAG rep, um, Southern California Association of Governments, uh, by design. Uh, however, um, Mr. Denver, Mayor Pro Tem Denver, is our representative to WRCOG. WRCOG is a member of SCAG, and uh, we need to have representation as a city at the General Assembly meeting annually in May. And for the very specific purpose of the annual meeting in May 2015, I hereby appoint Mayor Pro Tem Denver as the General Assembly rep for this year. Does that need to be ratified by consent of the consensus of the council? Our policy, that's a very good question. Our policy does require ratification of outside. It would be helpful to do so. I would, I, I want to be correct. So may I have a, a, a motion to ratify that appointment? So move. Well, that's a motion. I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Edgerton. Yes. And is there any objection to that appointment? Hearing none, that appointment stands. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Represent us well out in the desert. Um, on to city attorney reports. Yes, very briefly, Mayor, I just wanted to tell the council that on your next agenda, you will be getting the public educational and governmental programming ordinance uh, for cable television. Uh, I raised this a couple of months ago uh, with the council uh, by way of, uh, of recap. What the ordinance will allow uh, to happen is it will allow the city to collect an additional 1%, cu currently collects 5% of gross revenues as its cable television franchise fee. This ordinance will allow uh, that number to move to effectively 6% uh, with the understanding that that last 1% can only be spent on capital facilities for public educational and governmental programming, such as computer monitors and video cameras and the like. 
Um, I, it, I did not rerun the calculation when I uh, came to the meeting today, but last time I checked, that would amount to, I think, somewhere around $140,000 a year. Um, so we, you'll, you'll see a full report on that coming back at the next meeting, but I just wanted to highlight that it's on its way. Mr. Denver? Yes. Is there any possibility that we could get the, um, the uh, Channel 3 out of this money and get it connected so that we can have uh, city council meetings uh, on the city and all the different activities that are happening in our town? I, I, I will be happy to, to bring back as part, I'll bring back as a report, probably a city attorney report at the next meeting, how that channel three piece works with the revenue collection. Because the, the, the ordinance that's coming back is really about getting the 1% for public educational and governmental programming. There's another portion of the Digital Infrastructure and Video Competition Act that deals with whether and which cable television companies have to provide access and on what channels. And I'll, I'll give you an update on that. Thank you, Mr. Melching. Mr. Johnson, city manager report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, as you heard tonight, there's a couple of uh, special events coming up. Uh, I think we did miss, though, there's a street dedication for Sergeant uh, Nigel Kelly. That's uh, on this Saturday at the, at the uh, KB Home uh, Development and Audie Murphy Ranch. I think that's at 10 o'clock. The Menifee Half Marathon is this Saturday. It kicks off at MSJC at 7 a.m., I believe, with the Bullhorn and the mayor. Is that correct? And um, the planning, the uh, community development department would uh, request, and I would as well, uh, council to, to look at setting a prioritization for the development code, specifically on the EDC portion of it. Uh, we're having a lot of folks come in, as you know and recall, the reason we set that aside was for our commercial retail development in our highly traveled corridors. Um, and there's a few issues on folks who want to come into that area, but don't, we don't have a development code uh, specifically ready for that. Um, and they're looking, and we're, we're tag teaming to go out there and bring people into that area. And uh, I'm going to throw it to Bob for just a minute. I'm catching him off guard. Um, but I think what we're looking for is for council to uh, express uh, some uh, push to get that EDC portion of the development code um, maybe moved up a little bit. Is that, is that where we're? Yes, that's, that's correct. There's been um, several study sessions with the Planning Commission with regards to the EDC uh, regulations, and they're uh, very diligent in going through that process. Um, but we do need to, we want to keep the whole process moving. We've got the whole, the entire development code that we need to get through as well. So. We're going to probably need to pick up the pace a little bit here, but that is a very important one, the EDC, with regards to development in the city. So that is a priority for us to get completed. Mr. Leesmeyer. Uh, what exactly do you need from us? I mean, I, when I left the Planning Commission, we had a meeting on those. Every single meeting, we were touching something on EDC. So did that, did that stop? I, I would suggest a conversation with your individual <coughs> planning commissioners okay. on how that's going. Okay. Is that fair enough? With that. Uh, a couple other items we have, uh, Master Plan Workshop number two is Monday, uh, April 20th. That is at the Wheatfield Park Menifee Gym between Wheatfield and Bell Mountain uh, Middle School, six o'clock, at six o'clock. And then finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Menifee Better Together is April 25th, and that is combined with the Quell Valley cleanup. So we'll have uh, several hundred folks uh, running around not only Sun City proper cleaning up some houses as Ms. Sobeck uh, shared with us, but also at Quill Valley uh, Cabian Park uh, doing our annual cleanup uh, event there as well. I'll be flipping burgers at 1.30 at 12, so I'll be ready for 1.30. Great. That's all Thank I have. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Leesmeyer. Rob, I'm a little unclear. Are, are you saying that our planning commissioners are reluctant to work on the development code? I'm saying that the EDC portion of the development code uh, should be moved up and worked on first. That's our best opportunity to bring development in that's going to be high sales tax dollar driven. And, and we, don't, we don't have a policy for that. So when you look at it as a, as a total, uh, much like we did with the general plan, we had seven different elements we had to go through and we had to calculate which of those elements we needed to get done first. Right. I think we need to prioritize the EDC area as uh, the best opportunity to get that done first. I think if you go by alphabet, 
A, B, C, D, E, economic development is there. <laughs> there you go. Go by alphabet. We can bring this back for a further update if you'd like, but I'm just requesting that we uh, work yes, on the EDC area first. Sorry, I, I, I don't. Just uh, like I said, when I, when I left the Planning Commission, that was something that was going on. I mean, up until that November, and it just stopped at some point. I, I didn't say it stopped. It slowed. Okay. We have a second workshop on the EDC coming up, and I think it should be a priority of the Planning Commission. That's what my request is. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Edgerton is inter uh, interested in speaking. Mr. Edgerton, did you want to speak at well, this point? Clarification, I, uh, with specifics, I didn't really understand totally 4.2. Does that mean you take off autos? Or what, what does that mean, 12.2 under discussion? Proposal for summer schedule for all city meetings. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Edgerton, that was that we would go dark in July, so there would be no council meetings, no committee meetings, and no commission meetings uh, in the month of July. So we're swapping it for August, or I mean, most, uh, not, I have no concern, but most cities use August as their month, but their reason. Yes, uh, for us for July where the schools and the uh, vacations uh, are out, it's typically June and July here with the uh, students going back to school the second week of August typically. Um, so if you took August off, um, there may be some folks who don't have an opportunity to go on vacation in July. Um, that's kind of what we were looking at. So all this means is that the month of July meetings. That's correct. And typically the first meeting in July falls near or on July 4th, and we are jockeying for position uh, at that council meeting as well. And that, but that does mean the meetings in August will go forward. Yes. August okay. will go forward. Yes. Does that, hey, you're welcome. does that conclude your city manager report? Yes, sir. Thank you. On to future agenda requests from council members. Are there any items? Of Mr. Denver. Um, some time ago, there was an article in the paper about Murrieta City Council voting 5-0 to uh, put unanimously the national motto up in the city hall. Um, I did some homework about it at great length and found that uh, historically in, this, in the country, we had numerous mottos. It turns out that based on the different area you were from and whether there was a war going on and uh, any number of different variables, there were uh, mottos for that area and that time. As time passed, there were uh, mottos became uh, apparent for our, our country. In 1956, the Congress got together and decided that we would have a uh, nation one motto, and they put that together. Uh, I did some homework having to do with the cities around that have this motto placed in their city hall or uh, different places, and it's, it's over half. Um, also, this, uh, the motto was put on buildings that were built back in 1800, early 1900s, a long time ago. And I believe that's why they chose this particular motto. Uh, also, if you go to Riverside, you'll see it. So I'd like to uh, suggest, suggest that we uh, have a quick discussion having to do with putting the nation's motto in God we trust here in Menifee City Hall. Any comment? I think since that's the uh, law, I mean, a congressional action back in 1956 that encapsulated that, I think that's something that, unless there's no objection, we just have staff implement. That's something that we can implement, Mr. Johnson? Sure. Say no, I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Welcome. No, excellent idea to bring that forward. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. I think that's important to... Re reiterate that for us. Uh, any other council member agenda requests, Mr. August? No, sir. 
<laughs> I have one. Um, I would like to get a second on having staff bring back the previous staff report uh, to put a ballot measure up at the November 2016 election for the four-year mayoral term. Put it back before the, bring it back to council for us to decide with a twist. If we could also have built into the staff report uh, consideration for a term limit for the mayoral position uh, to make it to coincide with the uh, council districts. Because I think, this is just my opinion, but I think that that probably was the intention of the uh, will of the voter to do. Even though there was some confusion on the ballot in terms of there was term limits, then there was mayor, yes or no, there was mayor two year or four year, yes or no, and then there was a uh, uh, stipend increase for the mayoral position and I think that uh, I think what escaped in that process was a consideration of term limits for mayor so as we bring back that staff report assuming I get a second to even bring it back um, I would like to have that added in for discussion as well is there a second for that future agenda item I second it okay. thank you Mr. August Quick question. Uh, quick question, Mr. Mayor. When you, when you do bring that back, it would begin in uh, what year? In other words, if you were to vote on that and it benefited, and you were to run again and it benefited you, is there any way to, uh, do you have to distance yourself from that or would you feel more comfortable putting it, say, out to 2018 or something like that? Oh, we can discuss that. Um, <clears throat> we can bring it on the staff report. I think the staff report, the, I think the previous staff report that we considered was for it to be effective, uh, the election cycle that it's on the ballot. Okay. I believe well, that's we can the, talk yeah, about it. I discussion. believe that's how the previous staff report was written. Okay. But, but is, do you need anything else to bring that back? Okay. No. All righty. Um, is there any other business before the council tonight? No. Hearing none, we are adjourned. <laughs>